start uh, start the recording process. But uh, yeah, it started snowing here, and I think it's supposed to turn to rain. But it, we do have. Um, let's see if I can stretch the camera up. If you look out the window, there is a. Oh my god. <laughs> we do we do have snow, so it's funny that uh, I have to let everybody know that you know, there's snow in Boston and there's no snow in Maine. So the last time I saw you, I don't know if you remember, it was hot and humid. Yes, and, we were uh, sitting outside. <laughs> there was uh, there was an interesting thing. I you know, speaking of sitting outside, I read an interesting study that I'm done by one of the investment firms that um, outdoor dining takes a significant dive below forty five degrees. So like you know, probably means with the heat lamps and all the other stuff, you know. You know, 50 degrees manageable, you know, we can do outdoor dining, but this is going to be the real test of the, of the COVID effects on the reopening is going to be, you know, when three, three quarters, when, you know, when two, at least, you know, half the country or so is, it's too cold to dine outside. We'll, we'll see what happens. So, yeah, interesting yeah, stuff. Right. I'm a little bit less motivated to go out when it's below 40 degrees. You're right. I know. And well, you know, then the thing is, once again, I, I mean, I don't know, uh, you know, you probably figured this out, but you know, when you're in California, you didn't have this problem. But when you're, um, you know, when you're, uh, when it's colder out and you, you don't move around as much, you know, you tend to, you know, gain that winter weight. So you got to be really careful about making sure you still go for walks at least and do some, do some uh, Jane Fonda workouts at home and Richard Simmons and all that stuff. Uh, <laughs> that's those classics. <laughs> but um, anyway, what I want to do today was not only ask you about, um, reverse mortgage, you know, some of the stuff we had talked about, you know, the misconceptions, the information, getting some good information to people out there. But also, um, uh, I want to make this part of my entrepreneur interview series because, you know, I've, I've interviewed all types of people and it's a series of videos I do with people that, you know, that work for themselves. And, and the, the idea behind this that's germinating is that I think there's a lot of people, for example, in Gen X, like my generation, that um, would really, and I've had conversations with clients and potential clients to this effect a lot is they want to pivot out of corporate and um, you know and a lot of them have done have done well in corporate but they want to pivot out and they want to do something else but they're, they're, sometimes they've got the handcuffs you know they've done really well in corporate you know stock options and great salary etc I don't think they realize how much they're giving up and I actually need to do a video on 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 the misconceptions like, you know, there is this entrepreneurial kind of fantasy, but you have to realize, you know, that if you've got a good setting in corporate and you bring something to the table and you're a valued employee, you get all kinds of goodies. So, but, but the main focus of this series is that people work in, you know, that want to pivot to do something for themselves and you, you travel cross country, you, you kind of run your own thing from home. And the other entrepreneurs I've interviewed are different angles. You know, a couple of them are retail. One of them was a, you know, a dessert restaurant, had an attorney, had, um, a fellow does uh, you know web marketing and the insurance business and all this other stuff, um, and another guy was uh, he's like a creative guy does music does all kinds of stuff and so it's just people that are doing all different things as opposed to you know just doing the corporate job and then are you you're I guess I would put you under the category of of you know independent um, salesperson or you know consultant uh, and you know I guess you know someone in your position could also be doing insurance you could be doing um, accounting software advice you could be doing um all kinds of things right so um so you would be well, listening to you be very educational for somebody that in that background so i want to start off maybe you know 10 or 15 minutes talking about um just you know how you how you switched over to what you're doing now that the story you told me about the cross-country move and and you know why you decided to do this and and how it's affected your lifestyle and working from home and having that flexibility so uh, so you know harold Barr, reverse mortgage um, entrepreneur, uh, uh, expert, tell us how you got to Portland, Maine, and how you got into that field from, from your old life. Sure, sure. And you want me to do that right now? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Give us, tell, tell us wow. the story. Um, well, I, I, you know, my background is, is uh, I owned my own mortgage company for many years. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, without a doubt, I was an entrepreneur. And, uh, um, you know, I started my own mortgage company in 1999. And uh, it went good. It went good for a good solid 11 years until the financial crisis. Um, and then after that, uh, I, I think it was really tough for the small guy like me um, 
to succeed, I, although some have. It was, uh, I found it really difficult. So I started working for, um, for, bank, for basically mortgage bankers, and, uh, which I went right back into the corporate world. And I discovered after a few years, it just wasn't for me. It just wasn't for me. I, I uh, did not like to be handcuffed and, um, and listen, working in, my brother works for a, a large uh, corporation and does very well. And, and uh, I, you know, nothing about, nothing against that at all. But for me, it, it, it just wasn't the most exciting thing in the world. Um, I really like to be on my own. I like to experiment and, and find out what works. And, uh, and of course, I like the idea of as hard as I work, I get rewarded for that. Um, I liked it a lot. And so, um, yeah, I was in California for many years and my entire client base was in California. And last um, June of 2019, my daughter graduated high school and my wife and I, who owned a, a little condo in Portland, Maine, that decided to relocate across the country to get out of California. Um, California is a wonderful, beautiful place, but it's very, very expensive. And uh, as my wife and I approach retirement age, we're not there yet, but as we approach, um, you know, financially, it made the most sense for us to get out of California. Um, and so we, we chose Portland because I love Portland. Portland is the coolest little city in the world. And uh, yeah, it came with some real uh, great challenges. And those challenges are that I didn't know, any, I didn't know anyone here. Um, and so I moved here in September of 2019, Chris. And so my timing, I don't think it could have been any worse unless I moved here in February of 2020. But um, I moved here, I, I, you know, I joined, uh, you know, many organizations, uh, you know, mortgage broker organizations, realtor organizations, financial planning organizations. Um, and then COVID hit. And uh, COVID hit, uh, um, you know, in 2000, uh, in 2000, uh, I'm sorry, in, in March of 2020. And so there went all my networking because networking uh, in person, which I, ex I excel at, I love that. Mm. Um, I like shaking hands and kissing babies and uh, meeting people and uh, you know, doing all that stuff. I like that. Um, and it's fun. And, uh, and so I kind of lost that. Um, and I was not opposed to cold calling on credit unions or banks, just walking in, introducing myself. Now, I, they might not have been excited about me doing that, but I always look at I, I enjoy the challenge of doing that a lot. Mm. And that kind of all went away. And so when that went away, uh, I, we, I had to discover another way, Chris, to, to get business. Um, and I was able to do that through LinkedIn, networking through LinkedIn and creating Zoom meetings, which is how I met you. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, it's been, it's certainly, it's been a challenge. Uh, it's been a challenging year, no doubt about it, but I'm passionate about what I do. And I always look to the long term. Uh, you know, presently I work for a company. It's not a major corporation, but it's, 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 uh, you know, they're in the reverse mortgage field. They're a big player, but I am a uh, 100% commission. So I am, <laughs> I'm on my own mm. and uh, I do have the support. You know, the nice thing about that is I have the support of, of people helping me out, but essentially me creating business is completely up to me. Um, you know, uh, and waiting for the phone to ring is not a good strategy at all. Mm -hmm. So I've been aggressive in marketing and trying to create Zoom meetings and doing what I can to get business, and it's been successful. I've been really, really happy about that, and uh, mm -hmm. I've gotten to create some good relationships with that way. Great, so maybe just a couple of questions to provide advice to people that are trying to do something like you're doing. Can you uh, give us, a a brief outline of the LinkedIn Zoom meeting model you're talking about. I mean, I got it at the back end. You know, you sent out a note uh, through email, mess through LinkedIn messaging. Honestly, I've gotten f most of the email messaging I get in LinkedIn, about 50, uh, probably the last 50 messages, other than a friend of mine asking me to have a discussion about impact investing. The last 50 messages on LinkedIn are people trying to help me get clients, you know, help. Uh, they've got proven systems, et cetera. I'm like, well, if it's so yeah. good, just keep doing it for yourself and don't put yeah. it on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's anyway. Um, so your system though was was soft. I responded to you, maybe because you know, again, professional for professional. But can you tell us why you think your system is working for you as opposed to maybe other systems? I mean, just you know, don't to, you know to speculate on other systems. That's asking too much of you. Why is your system working for you? Well, I mean, that's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the, the first thing about LinkedIn is it's free. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of tools available in LinkedIn that you could take advantage of. 
to help create, um, you know, relationships. But what I did is I went a step further and I actually hired a team of people on my behalf to reach out to financial advisors because I network with financial advisors. They are very good referral partners for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and what they've done is they, they've, and, and listen, I, I get it all the time because I myself, every uh, LinkedIn messages I get is from a recruiter <laughs> or someone trying to sell me leads. Mm-hmm. So I totally get that. And so what we try to do is we just try to do, um, we try to be very, very, we try to be professional. And uh, the very first thing that we try to do is just connect with people. Uh, and then once we connect, uh, we try to, I, what I, you know, what one team has done is we try to, um, uh, uh, reach out again to that connection and, and to discover, to see if we have something in common in almost all cases we do, um, as a financial advisor, um, you know, there's, uh, you may have clients who may, might be in need of my services. And in my particular case, I always run into clients who are in need of your services. So it's actually, it's a really good match. Mm-hmm. And we just have to get over the fact where, um, where so many people in, in, on LinkedIn are spammed with, you know, with, uh, with advertisements and for pitches. And so really what I just try to do is say, hey, let's have a Zoom meeting. And many people have said, no, thank you. And, I, and my response is, okay, no problem. No problem. I, I get that. And so, but there are, you know, and you're one of them. You're, you, there are people who will, you know, who listen, who want to uh, reach out and, and network and connect. And, uh, and I think that's a, a, it's an advantage. And so that has worked for me. Connecting with people via Zoom meetings on LinkedIn has worked really well for me. Yeah, I think you have made a good point too when it comes to like outreach and marketing and stuff. It's not closing people. It's really like in my situation, I had a reverse mortgage fellow that I was using was pretty close to being retired. Just, I mean, just off the radar. And so when you came along, I didn't have a a solid go-to person. So it's sort of like, you know, the best, the best way I've just, I've heard described about marketing is it's sorting. It's not closing and selling. It's like you're, you know, you have something really good to offer people. And, uh, but again, if somebody has a good relationship, it doesn't matter how good it is, they're, they're going to be okay for now. But by talking to say a hundred people, you know, a few of them are going to be like in my situation where, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, there's, there's an opening and, uh, and, 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 we, you know, we need to address that. So yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. So you're, um, so can you, I, can I, can I touch one more thing on that? Yeah, and I, yeah, which sorry, I forgot to mention yeah. is the, the key is, is that, uh, the key is to try to uh, form a relationship, not to make a sale, mm. not to make a sale at all. So my, you know, that what, what my goal is, is to form a relationship with you or whoever I connect with on LinkedIn. I know that may sound a little bit weird, but really it's uh, I'm trying to uh, create a long-term connection um, rather than trying to make a sale because we're so overwhelmed with people trying to make sales to us. That's the last thing that I want to do is make a sale. Um, and also then I, I always ask, do you know about reverse mortgages and would you like to know more about them? And so I offer a, some education. Um, and so, so I, hopefully that helps it, it. So far it has helped and has worked out well. Yeah. I mean, you're a great resource. You know, your stuff. I mean, in your end, you have to know your stuff. You have to be a resource partner to people. If you're going to develop a relationship, they have to be able to turn to you. And like I said, you provide advice. And I, and again, even right away when we met, we know we were talking and there was an attorney with me and there was, potentially a client right away you know it's just like you said when people are trying to build their business they think it could take a long time but i'm sure you've had many conversations with people that almost immediately led to a potential you know relationship with a client just because they you know you hit it off well they uh, they liked you you like them and say hey okay great you know we did the did the vetting and the due diligence on this relationship and the way you do things and it leads to a business almost right away sometimes sometimes it doesn't but you have to realize that that's just that's how business is yeah, the interesting thing about that is when you, you know, when you, uh, what I found is that if if I make a good impression with someone and we connect like like I think I've done with you, is sometimes uh, it, it will happen where there'll be there'll be someone who's in need of that, and so you're right. Sometimes that can take a while, and then it's it's my job to stay connected with you. Um, but sometimes there'll be someone immediately, and that has certainly happened, where someone will said, "Yeah, as a matter of fact, my neighbor is looking for this," and and so yeah, it does. It takes work. It takes work. Yeah, and, no, uh, and you have to be willing to work, and you have to be willing to put it out there, and you have to be willing to have someone say, "No, no, thank you, I'm not interested." <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. <laughs> it so, happens and, all the time. <laughs> and so, so how's your lifestyle been now? I mean, you you know, working, you know, 
pretty much you're not responsible for anybody else. Like you have a team of people that help you, you know, get, get some, um, you know, get leads, et cetera. But as far as that, I mean, you're running your own show. So you answer to yourself and uh, it, you know, it doesn't mean you don't work. I mean, you have to put the work in, but what's your day like? I mean, do you feel that you're able to really, you know, have more balance in your life doing what you do now than you did in those few stints you did with corporate, you know, in between your mortgage business and that. And I assume you maybe did corporate before 1999 because I don't think you and I ever talked about your, your first life there, but I did. Uh, I did. Um, so do you feel like the balance now that you have, I mean, what, what are the advantages to, to work from home? I mean, obviously the disadvantages, you're not around a bunch of people to chew the, chew the rag with or, or whatever that expression is, but in the water cooler talk, but what are the advantages of, of, of you know, your setup right now? Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm quite used to it. So COVID really hasn't changed that at all. So mm -hmm. I've been working from my home now for a number of years. Um, so that hasn't changed it. What, uh, you know, what has changed is my ability to network with people. Um, and by the way, if, if, I, if I seem distracted, I, I live in a, a beautiful condo here in, in Portland. And right below me, they're doing a major remodel. And yeah. I could hear everything they're doing right now. So, <laughs> well, the great the great um, thing about your headphones is I cannot hear any of it. So, oh, good, good. So it's I was good. worried about that. I just hear you. So yeah, so uh, so COVID really hasn't affected what I do, which is I get up um, and and I work. I work and mm -hmm. I work. Uh, um, in a, we have a spare bedroom, so I work in the spare bedroom. Um, what it has affected is, uh, as I mentioned, my ability to network. So I used to attend, mm -hmm. you know, networking events all the time you know, multiple times per week. So it has affected that. And so, uh, as I mentioned, I am aggressive on LinkedIn. I try it that way and I'm on the phone and I call and I talk to people and um, that's pretty much the best that I can do right now. And, I, you know, I have loans going on right now and uh, I, you know, I, I continue to, uh, to not network, but to be, uh, to try to give, uh, try to provide value uh, on my post on on uh, LinkedIn, mm. and so I, I'd like to stay in people's you know on top of mind for people, and uh, it seems to be working. You mentioned that. So one thing that's interesting that you can do now that maybe you wasn't, maybe your target market being seniors would not have been open to it before as much. But you have clients all around the country, and you I have se you know senior clients because of COVID were forced to learn how to e-sign things or worst case is you've got to drive, you know, three hours to have them sign something through the door. But in a lot of people are e-signing stuff. You've got clients in all different states. And this is just something that seniors would not have done even two years ago. They want to deal with people locally. We know that every, you know, marketing guru to seniors tells you that, but you've been able because, and, and this has been actually, do you feel like it's been a boost to your business and to people like you? Because now all of a sudden, the, the requirement to to do things electronically has greased the tracks for you to deal with people that might not have done that before. So in a, in a weird way, it might have crimped your networking, but increased your potential market and the more, your, your efficiency because if someone can e-sign something, you just save two or three hours of driving. And a lot of paperwork as well. So you're, you're, yeah. you're absolutely right. So um, I have clients uh, currently who are who live outside of Boston, mm -hmm. and I've been to their homes, but I've never met them. So I dropped off items on their front stoop, and they would you know provide items for me. They do not want me in the house. They didn't want appraisers in the house, and and I don't I don't blame these folks at all. Um, you know, if you're in a if you're if you're elderly and and yeah, I completely understand that. Um, and so the challenges are are some seniors are not uh, tech savvy at all. Um, some of them are not. Most are. Most of the boomer generation is. Mm -hmm. And so, and, and yeah, this is usually a product where you would sit at the kitchen table um, with someone to try to explain it, to, to make them feel more comfortable about this. Right. And so that option primarily is gone now. And so, yeah, there's a lot of education over the phone, over Zoom meetings. Now I've done many educational Zoom meetings with clients and talk them through what they're signing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that's, so that's kind of how the business is now. It's just the way it is right now. That's exciting. I and mean, that's be a good segue into actually talking about the reverse mortgage business. So for people who are, you know, watching the video that were interested in, in, you know, well, geez, I want to be like a, 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 a work from home um, sales consultant, uh, you know, Harold's a great example of pulling that off. And he did it your way with your, you know, with, with your, you know, COVID inspired uh, LinkedIn video Zoom setup. I mean, there's other ways to do it, but that's your way and it works for you. And, uh, you know, let's get into talking about reverse mortgages because the other part, next part of the video is I want to use the video to also to people that are, um, 
you know, just want to know about this product, this kind of Enigma product that I think people, you know, most people in the country are going to think, oh, that's something you think about, obviously, when you're at least 62 years old or something. Um, so it doesn't just, it, people, most people can even get one if they wanted it. So it doesn't matter. You know, if you were 30 years old and you owned a $2 million house with no loan on it, you could not get a reverse mortgage, right? You have to be right. 62. So it's right. just, you know, I mean, it'd be nice that those people would be forced to take out a regular mortgage with payments, but... Um, but it'd be nice if you inherited a $2 million home and just live off the reverse mortgage the rest of your life. But yeah. the old, the old knock again, let's, 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 let's target some, some tap and let's target some, some misconceptions about reverse mortgages and just kind of going to have a conversation about the product. So the, the, the first, the first point was, and this is probably going back to the original iteration of the product is that they're expensive. So answer that. Oh, Harold, reverse mortgages are expensive. I don't want to do that. Well, I guess, you know, compared, compared to what is always a, is a good, you know, is a good, you know, you're, you're sometimes with a senior, the only other option they have is to sell their home. And so a reverse mortgage is certainly less expensive than selling your home. And uh, primarily there's two types of reverse mortgages. And so the, the most popular one, which is the government one, it's guaranteed by HUD and it's an FHA product, has something called mortgage insurance. And there's no getting out of the mortgage insurance. Every single person that gets a HECM uh, reverse mortgage, which is um, which is the government backed uh, reverse mortgage. The home, has home, to pay. home equity conversion mortgage is that. The yes, HECM? I'm sorry. Yeah, HECM is home equity conversion mortgage. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, and they have to pay for mortgage insurance, which is a two percent charge of whatever the house is worth. And so, yeah, so that is that's a big expense, and there's no getting around that. Um, I wish that I can actually credit it for you. We're not allowed to do that. Um, but uh, what that in turn does is it guarantees the borrower for the life of the loan uh, that it's, it's a non-recourse loan. And at the end of the loan, should the, the loan balance exceed the value of the house, then um, the deficiency balance is not passed on to the heirs. And so that's what the mortgage insurance covers. It prevents that from happening. And so it guarantees that, that for the, and, and pretty much that's an unlikely scenario, especially in the Boston area. But should the, you know, should the loan proceeds exceed the balance of the house, then there's, it's a non-recourse loan. And that's what the, uh, the mortgage insurance guarantees against. It covers, it goes into a pool and it covers that in the case that happens. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so without that mortgage insurance, it's pretty much like any other mortgage loan. Hmm. But that mortgage insurance cost is, you know, it's 2% of whatever the house appraises is for. So Harold, you have some products that are not, you know, the private market, not mortgage attached. So when you get into one of those products, you don't pay that 2%. What are the, uh, what are the fees? It, it's, it's more you like actually clo get, you closing yeah, costs, like attorney and just like you would a regular mortgage. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. And those are, that's called a proprietary or a jumbo mortgage. And so mm -hmm. it's for people who, for whatever reason, don't want to get a HECM. Uh, which is the government loan or they or the value of the house is great enough where getting a heck of wouldn't make sense and so with those loans you can actually get them at no closing costs so yes there are some closing costs which is appraisal fees title insurance attorney mm -hmm. fees but you can get some of those fees credited and so there's cases where believe it or not if you get one of those jumbo or proprietary mortgage that you can get them with no closing costs Interesting. and so that's that's one of the nice things about the jumbo or proprietary product is there any consumer protection differences between the government product and a private market product? Well, um, uh, there's a couple things. And so um, there, there's a part of the, um, they both have non-recourse factors. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, this, this is getting a little bit into the weeds and I don't want to get too far into the weeds, but the HECM or the government product has a line of credit. And so the, a huge difference between this and the jumbo product is that line of credit is guaranteed to grow at the rate of the interest rate being charged month over month, year over year until oh, okay. the end of the contract. Okay. It's guaranteed. That line of credit can never be pulled. It can never be called. Um, it's an actual guarantee. And so that is a huge difference between the, the HECM um, product and the proprietary product. The proprietary product has a line of credit, but it's only good for 10 years. Yeah, okay. The Heckam is good for, and it can grow. It's a, it's a unique product. It can grow uh, if the, the untouched balance or the unused balance can grow over a 20 or a 30 year period of time, which turns out to be a huge financial planning tool. Yeah. So the proprietary one being 10 years, you mean you have to pay that back in 10 years? 
No, you never have to pay a, a reverse mortgage back. So um, okay. So what's the ten year thing when you say that the proprietary is? There's a ten, ten year. There's a ten year draw period. Oh, okay. So that means yeah, you could use it for ten years. Then after ten years, you, you know, so the best advice to do is if there's any remaining credit left in 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 year nine and a half, to pull that money to pull that money out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so after ten years, you won't be able to use it. <laughs> okay. No, that's good, and that's something obviously you would walk through clients and explain the the, the various options and yeah. what makes sense. Uh, another uh, another thing, because this does happen, and it wasn't because of the actual product itself, but it's because of maybe just bad titling or not good advice from the person delivering the product. But people think, oh, if I die, and, you, and my wife will lose the house. So, like, you know, a married couple takes out a reverse mortgage, one of them dies, the other one gets kicked out of the house after the death of the first one. What was going on there? What was the what was the problem in the industry, and, and what's the easy fix to that? And it has been fixed, by the way. So. Mm-hmm. With it, just to just to just to let you know, so with a reverse mortgage, the contract or uh, it's the, the 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 loan is not over until the second person in the transaction either sells the house or passes. Okay. So if the husband should predecease, should die first, uh, the loan is not due until after the wife uh, moves out of the house or until after she passes. Okay. And so that is certainly could be a problem if uh, in years past, that could be a problem. Certainly kicking out someone, um, an elderly widow would, uh, would not be an attractive uh, thing to do at all. Right. And so uh, they've made significant changes. And I, again, it's the loan is due after the second person in the transaction either passes or sells the home. Okay. And, and in the previous days, the problem was that the somehow without thinking or whatever, let's say the husband would take out the reverse mortgage under his name only. And then when he died, there was nobody's, there, was, there wasn't a joint mortgage and that's why they would go after the home equity, correct? Yeah, and so yeah. the new, new loans, they require the both names on there or is there just a provision that if someone else has a deed on the house, no matter who signs this thing, you can't have that house until that other deed owner sells or dies or Right. And yeah, whoever, exactly. That's exactly it. And uh, it's, um, you know, it, again, it's a case where both, both parties are completely protected for the rest okay. of their lives. Um, and so I'm, I, I can't really speak to what happened years ago because I, I wasn't involved in reverse uh, when some, you know, b- back then, but clearly right now it's a, it's an excellent, safe, safe product. Oh, that's great. And um now here's the other the other fun one. These are all fun questions because they're they're just if you just put a little thought into it, you realize how ridiculous it is. But if I get a reverse mortgage, there'll be nothing left for my kids. <laughs> so just I have to ask. These are the things people have brought up over the years, you know. And I guess if you don't pay attention to the product, it, you, you just you hear these anecdotal stories. It's like politics and everything else. You hear an anecdotal thing and you get you fly off the you, know, you fly off the handle. But what is the, what was that all about? Well, what well I mean, first of all, I, I've heard it all. I've heard yeah. every negative thing that, whether it be true or not, I've heard it. So, um, so it used to be with a reverse mortgage where you can pull out a significant uh, uh, more amount of equity out of your home. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, in some cases, people can pull out maybe 80 or 90% of the, the equity in the home. And then there'd be no equity left for the heirs when, when, the, uh, when the borrowers would pass. And so there's been significant changes. So if you, if you look at it as a rule of thumb, now me to this exactly, but as a rule of thumb, pretty much you're only going to get about 50 to 55% of the equity in the home right now. Mm. And so um, it's, uh, you know, and it's another case where the, you know, the heirs may say, well, you know, we we want that equity, you know, we, you know, (laughs) we want to have that, but, (laughs) but, but typically what happens is, like just say in an area like in the Boston area, with interest rates being so low, um, you know, uh, with and, and how with a reverse mortgage grows because there's no payments being made, the house value also grows. And mm-hmm. so there's still a ton of equity left. And I could show you amortization schedule after amortization schedule showing that there's still a ton of equity left in the house. Mm-hmm. And with the provision where they could only tap 50% of the equity in the home, it's, it's, uh, there's always, I don't want to say always, that's a bad word to use, but there's, mm. in most cases, there's plenty of equity left for the heirs. And bottom line too, is I think what people don't realize if a million dollar home and you use a hundred thousand of equity in the reverse mortgage and you take that out and you die, the reverse mortgage company does not keep the other 900,000. It's not, you're not, 
I mean, these, these are, this, this is, this, 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 it's funny, this is some of the, this is some of the ways that this question has been approached to me. You know, they think that once the reverse mortgage is on the house, reverse mortgage company owns your house. And what you said too, you know, if you don't use the equity, it goes to the heirs on the death of the, of the homeowners, but also too, that if you have a 20% increase in the price of the home over the next 10 years, that 20% on the entire balance still stays in your name because it's like having a mortgage. You know, when yeah. you take out a loan on a house and the house goes up 10%, you don't share that with the mortgage company, the, the increase in the house. So that was interesting. People thought once that home mortgage, from my experience, once they, that home mortgage, a reverse mortgage company had a, a, the lien on the house, that's like, it's theirs, you know, and maybe they might let the kids have something at the end, you know, <laughs> it was just it sounded more dastardly, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's one of the myths of reverse mortgages. The bank then owns your home, which right. they don't. A reverse mortgage is, is just like any other loan like any other mortgage loan, with the exception where mortgage payments are optional. Hmm. So you can make mortgage payments if you, if you want to, but you don't have to. Right. And if you don't make mortgage payments, the payments get put on the back end of the loan and the balance grows. But again, in a situation where if your house is growing, there's still going to be a ton of equity left. And again, they only tap into that 50%. So there's, in, in most cases, there's a lot of equity remaining. Yeah, people might not realize that also. You take that same scenario, you have a million dollar house, you've drawn 100,000 out, you have a $100,000 balance, your sister passes away and leaves you half a million dollars, you can pay back that balance and close out, that, close out the note, just like any other mortgage. Just it's like not, any other mortgage, there's no prepayment penalty. Right. Um, because of the mortgage insurance cost, it's not a great short-term loan. Right. In other words, you, you don't want to take out a reverse mortgage and pay it off the next year because you've paid all that money for, um, but you could, if you inherited a half million dollars, right. well, then it really wouldn't matter. That, so that's, a, that's an unplanned for situation, but it's yeah. not something that would not be uncommon these days. You know, you have a lot of uh, baby boomers is a large generation, a lot of people. I even have a few clients that, you know, they're single, they, they're leaving money to friends, you know, and, and the, because they don't have kids and stuff, you know, really close friends. And I know some of the clients, I know some of the friends, and I can see this scenario, that friend, one of the friends not being so financially well off, I could see that person taking out a reverse mortgage and I could see them, if something happened, inherit, you know, this client's money and she has a decent sized net worth, it would be. So I, you know, I can see these being scenarios that will come up and probably already do come up plenty of times. And so just the, the end buyer, the end user or the end, the, the, the loan recipient needs to understand that it's just a loan, you can pay it back. And, you know, then of course, you know, whether you have fees or not, depending on, you know, the initial consult with someone like you as to should we go to the HECM program with the government or should we go to, you know, a, a private one. So it's uh, um, interesting. Um, now, you mentioned getting about half the money. Obviously, uh, you can get a lot of money out of these things if you go private and you live in a place like you used to live in or I live and stuff, you know, you're in California or you're in Boston or New York or DC, you can get a pretty big loan amount. I started on, I just started talking about how much you can actually get from reverse mortgage in some of the higher um, home price areas. And it's, it's pretty, pretty large amount. Yeah. So uh, I, I actually have one going on right now. And the man lives in uh, Nantucket. His house is worth about a million and a half dollars. Got mm -hmm. a beautiful house. And I think he's getting 700 and something thousand. I can't remember the exact amount, mm -hmm. but he's getting a, a significant amount. And right. so it's, and it's working out really well for him, by the way. Good. Okay, great. I mean, that's uh, so obviously, you know, I think with that kind of money, if you're 68 years old, 72 years old, and, and you just, you want to, you don't want to disrupt your lifestyle. You, you happen to own an expensive home, you're short on cash. Um, you can maintain that lifestyle for a while to a while to come with that kind of uh, with that kind of loan amount available. I mean, you may, yeah. not, you know, your kids may not end up as rich, but you know, a lot of times it's you know, if you want to maintain your lifestyle, it's possible. Yeah, Chris, I, I think I may have mentioned to you that the majority of my clients that were, when I was in California were all upper middle class uh, clients who, who you know they lived in very nice houses in the in the San Francisco Bay Area, and they wanted to continue their lifestyle, and so. Uh, you know, these were robust men and, and, uh, and women, and they like to vacation. They, they, they like their stuff. And, you know, so what a reverse mortgage does, it lets them tap into a portion of the equity, just a portion of the equity, 
but yet allows them to, you know, with a line of credit, they can, they can use it if they want to, they can vacation or they don't have to use it. And they're only charging interest on the amount that they use. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, that's good stuff. And, and um, now somebody's already in a reverse mortgage. Okay. And they, let's say you're, you're in one of these million dollar houses, you took out half a million and you say, you know what, I just want to downsize. You know, I want to sell my house. I want to move to a condo, a $250,000 condo in Florida. Um, I, you know, I, I took out a half million dollar reverse mortgage on my million dollar house. My, my million dollar house is now worth a million too. I've got this 550,000, let's say that with interest, my, my mortgage grew to 575,000, but I want to just sell everything. It's a pretty straightforward process, isn't it? Nothing, nothing complicated here, correct? There's, not, there's nothing complicated at all. It's just like any other loan where they would mm -hmm. sell the house, any equity would go to them and they're free to do with that whatever they want to do. They can go buy a house or they could, you know, get another reverse mortgage on a property down in Florida, which, which would help them retain more of, uh, of the funds that they would have. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a reverse mortgage. It's just like any other loan mm -hmm. with the exception of uh, you don't have to make payments if you don't want to. You and I also discussed the, the, the sort of higher end planning uh, tactic of using a reverse mortgage on an expensive home to buy a little vacation home with no, really no out of pocket cost. You know, you, you, you own a, a million dollar house in the Boston area and you want to buy a little quarter million dollar Cape down in, you know, not on the water, of course, but you know, it's, it's down, down, down in, down in Cape Cod. And, uh, you know, your, your options are to take a mortgage out on the place, maybe use your cash if you have it, if you don't, but also potentially use a reverse mortgage. Now, again, this is, this is, an, this is a more aggressive tactic for reverse mortgage. It's not the poster child use of reverse mortgages when they first came out. But talk a little bit about some of these advanced planning uh, tactics for people who are trying to just do more, get more, I guess, get a little more offensive or get more on the offense financially with, with these tools. Yeah, I mean, that's the, uh, you know, what I look at this as a financial planning is exactly um, what folks like that should be doing. Uh, and so, you know, clearly, um, you know, oftentimes people, their, their choice is that they can take a, uh, in this particular example, they can take out a mortgage on the property. And as you're either in retirement age or approaching retirement age, the last thing that you should be doing is taking out a mortgage um, with, with fixed payments. And so their options are they could either get a mortgage on the property or they can start liquidating from their you know, retirement portfolio. Uh, and so what a reverse mortgage does, it gives just another option where you don't have to do that. And you could use you know, the equity that's presently in your home and while your home continues to grow. And you could use some of that equity to buy a place on the Cape. And guess what? The house on the Cape will continue to grow in value as well. And so when you decide that you want to retire and possibly move to the Cape, you can sell your house and pay off that loan. And so it's really, it's a win-win for everybody and it, it maintains their retirement portfolio because that's one thing that you don't want to start drawing down on if you could avoid that. Next question would be uh, having to do, having a trust. Uh, you know, some people have a revocable trust and some people, take on an irrevocable trust planning for nursing home expense protection or something like that, that maybe down the road may need some money. So there's two types of, of trust scenarios here. One's revocable trust. Address those in, in, in terms of dealing with a reverse mortgage and, and clients you've worked with. They have no issues at all. No really? issues at all with, with, with any type of trust. So it's perfectly okay. And Chris, can I, can I address something uh, yeah. on the previous question that you had? Hmm. And uh, this is also, it's another, um, that's another financial planning tool. And so oftentimes, not, not oftentimes, but every once in a while, we'll see someone who is interested in their, in their legacy wealth, passing mm -hmm. on their wealth to their, to their kids and their grandkids. And so sometimes what people will do is they'll take, out, uh, they'll take out a reverse mortgage to buy a life insurance policy, a life insurance policy that has a rider for long-term care. And um, so that, that's also another option of what people do. Not everyone does it, but people who are concerned with legacy wealth. And so they can buy a, a policy a couple times greater than the amount of the value of their home. So mm -hmm. if they have a million or $2 million home, they could perhaps get a $3 million policy. Okay, so they get a $3 million life insurance policy. So when they pass, 
that policy goes directly to their heirs. There's no taxes on it. There's no capital gains. There's no hassle for selling the home. Mm. And so that's, it's also another product for that, which recently we've seen used. And it's pretty interesting about that. Yeah. Well. Um, so then to answer your questions, trusts don't affect the reverse mortgage at all. So you could have your house in a trust, no issues at all. Okay. And um, now the, the last kind of biggie, probably someone will probably bring up to you is, wouldn't it be better just to borrow money in a regular mortgage and pay it back? So I need, you know, I need 300,000. I've got a million dollar house again. We'll just keep picking on the same person with the million dollar house. <laughs> and I will, you know, I, I can take out a $300,000 reverse mortgage or I can just take out 300 from, I'll take a line of credit from, from my local bank. And sure, just, you know, sure. What, what's the, what's the pros and cons there? Is there, is there, what are the big ones? I mean, obviously you can just look at the numbers, but what's, well, uh, it's, you know, many people do. And so that's what we compete uh, against oftentimes is a, just a standalone line of credit that the bank offers. And one of the primary reasons for that is they're pretty inexpensive to get. Um, but so here's, here's the reasons why you shouldn't do that. Um, and there are pretty dangerous reasons as well. So first of all, when you take out a line of credit on your home, if you borrow against it, you must make a mortgage payment you must make a monthly mortgage payment. You can never not make a payment. Mm. Something happens to you and what happens is you're entering the demographics where health wise things do happen. And so tragically, if, if the husband should pass away, well then the wife is stuck making that mortgage payment and she might not have the income that she did with the husband. Mm. And she will be stuck making that payment. If she can't make the payment, then she must sell her house or she must deplete her assets to pay off that loan. And so it's, um, it's a scary thing for, uh, and again, it's, it's, a, it's a thing where my philosophy is that if you're of retirement age, you should not have a mortgage payment unless you're of course very, very wealthy. Um, there's, one great, great point, yeah. there's one other reason. Great point. There's one other reason. With equity lines, with every equity line, with every bank and with every credit union, the equity lines are good for 10 years. At the end of 10 years, if you don't refinance it and get another equity line, then what happens is whatever balance that you owe gets put on to a 20 year term. Okay, so what most people do is they, they just pay them off or they refinance them. But what if in 10 years from now, you can't qualify to refinance? You will be stuck with whatever balance that you have that will be put on a 20 year note and you'll have to make principal and interest payments. And that's the last thing that a retiree could afford. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a great point. And um, yeah, wow. So you have a, a you know, it, it is there. I think you mentioned this earlier, you know, especially when you're talking to older people, you can't just go back to work. There's a lot of things you can't just do. You might not qualify for the loan. Having more certainty in planning when you're at your most vulnerable is important. And, you know, oftentimes you, you probably, I mean, I've seen this where like the children of a, of, a, of a senior will say, oh, just do it this way or whatever. Because, you know, for their situation, maybe getting a line of credit makes more sense. They have a good job. Everything is good. But when you're uncertain and you, you're not sure how things are, you really can't go back to work. You're 75 years old and you're planning for the next 10 years and thinking at 85, I'm going to go get a job or just all these variables. Right. You have to plan for more certainty. And it's sort of like, um, you know, taking out a fixed, if you don't have extra cash hanging around, you take out a fixed mortgage instead of a variable because you don't want to take these chances. Um, side question, can you get a fixed, fixed rate on a, on a um, reversible mortgage or reverse mortgage or are they all variable? No, you absolutely can. So uh, in most cases, the overwhelming majority are, um, are adjustable loans, uh, but you absolutely can get a fixed, fixed rates are great right now. They, for the, for the, um, for certain circumstances, they're a perfect solution. So in other words, if you had a borrower whose house is worth uh, $760,000 and they owe $330,000, they don't want any additional money. They don't want a line of credit. They just want to pay that mortgage off. Well, then the fixed product may be perfect for them. And so you pay off the mortgage. It's a fixed rate. It's a low fixed rate. And right now rates are extremely low. Mm -hmm. They could probably get something in the very low fours. Now, mortgage rates are lower than that. Yes, they are. But uh, getting something in the 4% range, <laughs> it's pretty good on a reverse mortgage. And uh, so then they would not be in a position where they would ever have to worry about or be concerned about what the interest rates are doing. Yeah. No, that's great. 
Uh, any wrap up comments about, um, I might've missed something. So uh, summation or missed points or, or things you want to emphasize about, about getting a reverse mortgage and how that fits into, into, into a client's planning that you want to share before we wrap up that segment. Sure. Yeah. What, what I like to say is what a reverse mortgage does is it, it, it lessens the risk for the retiree. Mm -hmm. uh, when you retire, you don't want to, you don't want to take on more risk. You want to take less risk. And that's what a reverse mortgage does. Um, it's a product that allows you to not make a payment. If you don't want to make a payment, you could make a payment if you wanted to, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it makes your retirement more comfortable. And I think that's what people are after. They're after more retirement comfortables. Uh, I mean, more, more comfortable retirements, I beg your pardon, and less risk uh, as they age. Yeah, that's a, that's a good summation. Well, it's good. So we, uh, Harold, we talked about, you know, being uh, sort of a solopreneur like you are. We talked about what you do. Um, if someone wanted to get into what you're doing or just they want to work from home, they like to have that, that flexible consulting business. You know, in addition to what you talked earlier about how you built your practice, what advice would you give somebody who is thinking to do something like you did? Not necessarily reverse mortgages, but just, you know, the, the work from home, I want to work for myself. What, what advice would you have for that person? Well, you know, the first thing is that you have to know whatever it is that you want to be involved with. You have to know the product or, or in my case, reverse mortgages. You have to know them. You have to be really an expert on that. And I think that really helps. And I, I'm passionate about them. I love them. I, I, I love working with the senior community and that sure does help as well. And so I can't imagine being, you know, putting so much effort into something that you're really, that you don't care about. So I, I care deeply um, about, uh, about reverse mortgages, about the senior community. And I think that really helps. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, Harold, listen, I appreciate this. I, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up here. You and I will certainly be talking some more and, um, but as far as this goes, I want to thank you for being part of my entrepreneur interview series and also, um, you know, sharing with us some wisdom and hoping this video is helpful also to people maybe just considering the product and they don't know if the person they're dealing with is, is, is ethical, et cetera. And they can get some really good impartial advice from you here because, you know, you're in a video, you can't go out and grab them. So, you know, they can come here, but hopefully this is just a resource that I plan to, you know, share with people. If they want to know about the product, I'll explain to them, but also, you know, point them to the second half of second half of this interview. And then, you know, I'll also have people I'll run into who are you know, maybe age 40 plus that say, I need to pivot. And I'll say, well, listen, you need to watch a few of my videos. Someone like Harold can tell you, you know, how you can cross country, you can change your, you know, kind of change how you do things, get flexible, enjoy views of construction, things like that. Um, yep. You know, all kinds of good things. But listen, Harold, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on and, and doing this with me. And uh, hopefully I'll check in with you soon. I appreciate you asking me. Have a great one. Take care. Thanks, Harold. Bye-bye for now. Bye.